Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad, wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, amma bada habita fillah, continue on in our study of Bulugh al-Maram, kitab al-Nikah, related to the ahkam al-Talaq, divorce. We reach the Bab al-Nafaqa, the chapter, uh, or the, uh, the, the chapter of uh, maintenance. And in this chapter, <clears throat> before we get into the Ahadith, the chapter of maintenance refers to the provisions uh, that are required by the Shara for the maintenance of one's spouse, one's wife, uh, and one's children, and the various, with regards to the various status uh, of the or statuses of the of the wife, depending on uh, divorce and the other ahkam related to that. So the Baba Nafaka is in reference. This chapter includes the extent to which one is responsible for his family. In expenses, and this is in relation to providing uh, food, shelter, and clothing. Uh, and of course, that includes a drink and those things which will help them in practicing uh, their religion and maintaining their uh, without having to beg or. Uh, and maintaining their honor, which the Sharia uh, preserves. And before we get into the ahadith that are mentioned, uh, some of the some important points regarding nafaka uh, is first and foremost that the wife or providing for the wife is an obligation upon the husband, as we mentioned uh, in some of the other ahadith that we we've already covered and there is no disagreement uh, with regards to this and one of the evidences is the hadith that was reported on the authority of Hakim Ibn Muawiyah al qushayri who reported on the authority of his father عنه, that he said I said O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is the right of the wife of one of us over him? He replied, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that you should feed her when you eat, clothe her when you clothe yourself, do not strike her on the face, and do not revile her or separate herself, separate yourself from her except in the house. And this is an authentic hadith. This hadith is very important and it brings about many benefits, but we will study this hadith in depth. Uh, when we get into uh, the chapter. However, it shows us the importance of providing for one's spouse and to what extent uh, this is necessary and also the general ta'amil or relations, uh, the way of treating one's uh, spouse. Also in another hadith reported on the authority of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that Hin bint Utba radiallahu ta'ala anha came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said to him, O Messenger of Allah, Abu Sufyan is a selfish man and he does not give me uh, what is sufficient for myself and my son except what I take from him without his knowledge. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, take what is sufficient for you and your son in fairness. This is also an authentic hadith. And this hadith we will also cover. But these hadith show us that this is an obligation. It's an important obligation that we should take very seriously. That this is the responsibility of the men uh, for taking care of their, their wives. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Kitab al Kareem, Arijal Qawimun al Nisa, that the men are the maintainers and protectors of the women. Uh, Another point with regards to nafaka or provision is that providing for a woman whose divorce is revocable 
is an obligation upon the husband. So this is also what we've already talked about fairly in depth when we talked about talaq, uh, divorce, and the idda and, and some of the other masail that we dealt with, uh, that providing for a woman whose divorce is revocable, meaning that her and the husband can come back together, he is she is still under his uh, authority, so to speak, and he is still responsible for her. And so... Uh, in accordance with the authority uh, reported on the authority of Fatima bint Qais تعالى, that she said, I went to the Prophet وسلم, and said, I am a daughter of the family of Khalid and my husband is so-and-so and he has sent notice of a divorce to me. So I asked his family for provision and accommodation but they refused me. They said, O Messenger of Allah وسلم, he sent notice to her of three divorces. She said, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Providing accommodation and sustenance is only an obligation upon the husband in the case of revocable divorce. And this is an authentic hadith that was narrated in Ahmed. And we also uh, took this hadith, which illustrates for us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Kitab al-Kareem, O Prophet, when you divorce women, divorce them at their idda, their prescribed uh, periods, and count accurately their idda, and fear Allah, your Lord, and turn them not out of their husband's homes. So this also shows that when it is not, uh, when it is a revocable divorce, meaning that the husband can take his wife back, they can still reunite their family, that uh, the man is, is responsible for her until the finishing of her edda, uh, uh, her waiting period. Uh, also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al-kareem, Lodge them where you dwell according to your means and do not treat them in such a harmful way that they be obliged to leave. So this also shows us the importance of that fair and kind and righteous treatment which was illustrated by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and is his sunnah Salawatu Rabbi wa Salamu Alayhi and we are ordered to follow his sunnah Sallallahu Alaihi وسلم. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fi kitab al kareem and for divorced, divorced women maintenance should be provided on reasonable scale this is a duty on al muttaqin or al muttaqun this is a duty upon the pious so letting us know that from the sifat and characteristics of the uh, mu'minin the the believers and the muttaqin the pious ones uh, in accordance with the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that it is an obligation to uh, take care and provide for the women and provide for them in a reasonable state. Uh, and so this brings up the, the next point, which was from the same hadith, the hadith of Fatima bin Qais, and that is that the hukum, which is that a, a man is not responsible for a woman who has he has irrevocably divorced her meaning that he has divorced her three times um, and so she does not receive maintenance from him uh, likewise another important thing we need to uh, discuss regarding provision is that there is no sustenance for the woman who is observing an idda due to the death of her husband unless she is pregnant so this also we discuss this in the ahadith that we took with regards to the widower. Uh, likewise, another important um, a, um, issue that arises regarding provision is that provision from father to son is obligatory and vice versa. Uh, and that is reported on the authority of Aisha anha, that she said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, verily the best thing that a man can eat is from what he has earned. And verily, a man's son is from what he has earned. This is an authentic hadith uh, narrated by Abu Dawood. Another important issue regarding provision, it is an ob uh, obligation for the master to provide sustenance for his slave. So if one uh, is in the situation uh, where they own uh, a slave, that uh, they are responsible for that slave. And that is what Islam has legislated and there are several evidences for this. Uh, likewise, and we, we discussed briefly 
that with regards to provisions, that accommodation and general sustenance is what has uh, is mentioned in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that we will cover within the uh, uh, in the first uh, ahadith that we uh, that we study. And in regards to that, in the hadith of Abi Huraira, عنه, he reported that uh, from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he said, Verily, Ar-Rahm, the womb, is derived from Ar-Rahman, the most beneficent. So Allah said, Whoever maintains ties with you, I will remain ties with him. And whoever cuts ties with you, I will cut ties with him. And this is an authentic hadith. Also in the hadith uh, on the authority of Anas ibn Malik عنه, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, He who is desirous that his means of sustenance should be expanded for him or his age may be lengthened should join the ties of kinship. And this is an authentic hadith. So it shows us one of the means for our risk to have our sustenance increase is by maintaining the, maintaining the ties of kinship and taking care of those we are charged in authority over by spending upon them and those are just some of the important things regarding provision that we need to uh, consider when studying this chapter Bab an nafaqa in the 975th hadith narrated Aisha anha Hind the daughter of Utba the wife of Abi Sufyan came to Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, O Allah's Messenger, Abu Sufyan is a miser who does not give me and my sons enough maintenance, except what I take from his wealth without his knowledge. Is there any blame on me for doing this? He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied, Take from his wealth what is reasonable and enough for you and your sons. Uh, this is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. And in this hadith, there are immense uh, benefits with regards to this hadith. One of the benefits of this hadith is it shows us that it is permissible to enter into the home of the mufti, of the scholar when seeking a, a fatwa or a religious ruling or uh, for, for knowledge purposes. Uh, and that uh, this can be something which is uh, necessary from time to time. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that it is permissible to specify a particular individual uh, or refer to a person by their in relation to their relationship to someone else. And that's why uh, I, uh, Aisha anha, she said, Bint Ut, uh, Utba, the daughter of Utba. And so this was a, uh, a kunya, which was showing the relationship of, of uh, this Sahabiya to her uh, father. And so this was a kunya, which shows the permissibility of this uh, practice. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that it is permissible to mention someone who is uh, absent uh, with something they dislike if there's an absolute necessity to do so. If there is a haja. So in this situation, uh, the daughter of Utba was mentioning about uh, Abu Sufyan and she said, uh, uh, that he is a miserly man. And of course, he was not present, firstly. And number two, that this was mentioning him in a negative way. So this shows that if there is an absolute hajjah, then it is permissible 
to do this practice. Otherwise, the Prophet وسلم, would have made inkar. He would have uh, uh, spoke out against this uh, this practice. But rather, it was uh, a necessity. So there there was a need to do so. So it shows us that this is a permissible uh, permissible practice at times. However, we have to be able to determine when that is permissible and when it is not. That does not mean we go around talking about our spouse's uh, business to every uh, individual in the street, in every uh, imam or every marcus, a dawah, or whatever the case may be, or even a sheikh, but rather there must be wisdom and knowledge, it must be, there must be fiqh of when there is a, necess uh, a necessity to mention this specific individual and when it is not. So this comes with fiqh fideen, with knowledge uh, and understanding of the religion and in which the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ يَرَدَ اللَّهُ بِي خَيْرًا يَفَقَوْ فِي الدِّينَ Whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives him understanding of the religion. So this comes from the fiqh that Allah grants whomsoever He pleases by giving them understanding of the deen. So that way they know how to practice and when to ask and when to speak and so on and so forth. Another benefit of this hadith is it also shows that it is permissible, more specifically, uh, for a woman to describe her husband with something which is uh, could be negative or a shortcoming, again, endal haja, if there is a necessity to do so. So again, this is not something that should be encouraged unless there is a haja, unless there is a necessity uh, that is something necessary to speak about what's going on in your household, or whatever the case may be. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also, uh, it mentions the uh, detailed details and issue after speaking about something general, after being general. And that if something, it shows that if something is not, at times, is not detailed, then there isn't, uh, and, and doesn't have the, is not explained with the necessary details, then it has very little benefit otherwise. And so this hadith illustrates for us the importance of bringing the details issue after mentioning something general. Because being too general, uh, sometimes there is no benefit with regards to this. And specifically related to this hadith, uh, um, uh, the daughter of Utbah, Bint Utbah, Hind, she mentioned uh, specifically about her husband. She said, that he is a miserly man. So this is the specific after mentioning the general. And so it was necessary in order to bring, to bring these details in order to clarify this issue and to try to get a uh, appropriate uh, response and hukum and ruling with regards to her specific uh, challenge that she was faced with with regards to her nafaka. Another benefit uh, derived from this hadith is it also shows that a woman is responsible for her children and that, uh, you know, she came... It wasn't just the fact that, yes, her husband was, is responsible for her and, and spending on the children, but she had to ask on what she should do because she was still the remaining uh, person responsible for the uh, safety and security and spending of her children. So this is why she came to the Prophet and asked uh, uh, about this situation and was concerned about the well-being of her children. She said, uh, So it does not, uh, it was not sufficient for myself nor my children what he's spending. Okay, so she showed, uh, what we learned from this is it shows that the women are responsible for their children in the, uh, 
and their their well-being. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us the truthfulness of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum uh, and that they were also very clear in discussing they were very clear in discussing issues and very direct when needed to when it needed to be and so in this situation uh, she um, uh, bent uh, Utba that she was very uh, direct and very clear about her her situation and so this shows that the the truthfulness uh, and the uh, the honesty and directness of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum majma'in. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the uh, vigilance of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum uh, in understanding the truth and practicing it. And that for them it was not, um, you know, a, they did not seek knowledge just for the sake of saying they had knowledge and but rather they did so in order to be able to practice and come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this shows us the importance of talib al-ilm and that talib al-ilm talib al-ilm talib al-jannah as the salaf used to say that seeking knowledge is seeking paradise so that our intention should be sincere and it should be to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by learning his deen and practicing it and spreading it if we are able to do so. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that it's permissible for a woman to take the wealth, uh, something from the wealth of her husband uh, without his knowledge if there is again a haja, if there's an absolute necessity uh, for nafaka for her 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 spending and that's why the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said khudhi min malihi bil ma'ruf take from his wealth what is uh <clears throat> what is reasonable and enough for you <clears throat> so this shows us that is that this is a permissible practice if there's a haja again if there is a necessity meaning the man is is very miserly and he's not taking care of what she needs he, he doesn't give he doesn't provide the shelter he doesn't provide the her clothing what's necessary and he doesn't provide her uh, with the necessary food and 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 things that she need, she requires we're not saying the fact uh, that this is a situation where there wasn't a box of cereal in the house or there were, you know uh, but yes there's but there's all kind of other foods in the in, in the refrigerator and meats and fish and, and poultry and so forth. But this is a situation where it is actually affecting the actual needs of the household that he's not providing what is sufficient in shelter or what is sufficient in um, uh, in her in her, her needs, her clothing and so on and so forth. So under those circumstances that it shows that it is permissible for a woman to take from her husband's wealth without him knowing so uh, for a hajjah, for this, this necessity. Another benefit of this hadith is that it also shows us that, uh, that this is restricted, meaning that it is restricted with regards to the amount of uh, that the woman is taking from her husband without his knowledge. So it's restricted to what? It's restricted to ma'ruf. It's restricted to what is reasonable. What is reasonable according to the custom or is reasonable uh, basically in accordance with the, the custom of those people as far as what is uh, what determining exactly what is a hajj or what is exactly a necessity uh, to take. And that taking beyond that is impermissible. So it's not permissible for a woman just to steal from her husband, to take from her husband's wealth. But this is out of a hajj. This is out of a necessity. And that necessity is determined in accordance by the custom um, or the, the custom and the habits of the, uh, of the, the people 
of that locality. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also illustrates the permissibility of a man uh, addressing a woman who is uh, lawful for him to marry, uh, you know, who, who he cannot be alone with, uh, to address her if there's a need to do so. So this shows that Islam does not restrict us uh, when, when there's a need to uh, speak between the opposite sex, sexes to uh, attain a sharia maslaha or benefit or hajjah that it's permissible to do so. Uh, another uh, benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also illustrates an important principle uh, which is that if there is nothing stipulated specifically in the Sharia, then that um, in pertaining in regarding a, a, a specific ruling, then it returns back to the Orf, as long as that Orf, of course, those customs do not contradict the Sharia. So, for example, in this situation, the Prophet ﷺ said, خُذِي مِنْ مَالِهِ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Take from his wealth what is reasonable. So what is reasonable is is um, is is not exactly that can be an ambiguous statement or a statement that has more than one meaning or is not exactly specified. What does reasonable mean? Does that mean one dirham? Does that mean twenty dirhams? Does that mean a hundred dollars? What does that mean? So what is reasonable is then goes back as we mentioned prior to this. It goes back to the orf. It goes back to the custom. So what is reasonable within that custom to take? and fulfill the needs of that household. And there are many, many examples in the Shara regarding going back to the Urf and that the Urf Al-Ada Muhakama, that the Urf or the custom, uh, you know, that it has a precedence in Islam, you know, for, for making rulings and so forth. Uh, a, a last benefit I want to mention with regards to this hadith is this hadith also shows us that what is meant by uh, nafaqa uh, is what is kif is kifaya is what is sufficient, and not to and what is what it goes beyond that is not an obligation. So, for example, and this is why and the Prophet ﷺ said, "Ma yakfiki wa yakfi uh, uh, bunayik." Uh, uh, what what you know basically when he said take what is uh, sufficient for you and sufficient for your son that uh, this uh, sufficiency is kifaya this is what is sufficient what is necessary and that this is something important in the shar and with regards to that that taking beyond that in that situation would not be permissible. And so it also shows that the ulama, they deduce from this, that also what is necessary and required regarding a nafaka, uh, the spending upon the wife, what is an obligation, is what is sufficient. Not going beyond that. That means that if she, she is not in need for the safety and whatever of her family and so forth, a car, for example, that is not an obligation upon the husband to, to spend for that, but rather it's an obligation to spend what is a hajjah. That is what is the wajib. That does not negate the fact that he can spend and buy her gold and buy her this and buy her that. But as far as the obligation, that is restricted to what is the, uh, what is kifaya as far as the, uh, the clothing, the shelter, food and drink. Those are just some of the main uh, benefits that Imam bin Uthaymeen mentioned with regards to this very important and beneficial hadith. In the 976th hadith, narrated Tariq al-Muhayrabi al-Muharabi, we arrived, uh, we arrived at Medina when Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam 
was standing on the minbar, addressing the people and saying, the hand of the giver is the upper one. And spend first on those who are dependent on you, your mother and father, your sister and brother, then your relatives in order of their closeness to you. Reported by An Nisa'i, Ibn Hiban, and Darakutni graded it as Sahih or authentic. <clears throat> In this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it gives us a very important principle in Islam that many people neglect to practice. And that is, as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, the hand of the giver is the upper one. So, <clears throat> meaning that the one who gives is has higher a higher place and a higher status than the one who is asking and begging. We're not talking about someone out of necessity, but we're talking about in general that it is better to be be in the law of those who are giving, those who are giving and spending in their wealth. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem, وَمِمَّا رَزَقَنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ And from what we have provided for them, they spend. They spend. So this is a sifa, or a characteristic, of Ahl khair and the Mu'mineen, and those people who practice the Quran in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, from the fawaid or benefits of this hadith, one of the benefits is that it illustrates the lawfulness or mashru'iyah <clears throat> uh, of the practice of standing on the mimbar when one is going to give uh, a khutbah or a speech. And this is evidenced by the statement, وَهُوَ قَائِمٌ يَخْتُبُ This was referring to the Prophet ﷺ that he was standing and he was, uh, you know, preaching, giving the khutbah. Another benefit of this hadith is it also illustrates the hars or the vigilance of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in giving the the correct uh, putting everything in its rightful place, meaning that when it's an appropriate time to speak about a topic. The Prophet ﷺ spoke about that topic. So the Prophet ﷺ was uh, uh, very vigilant in delivering the message that would be conveyed to the believers during the khutbah and the, uh, the lectures, so to speak, the, the preachings, in that this would urge the believers and exhort them to practice and it would be something which is relevant for them uh, to know relevant knowledge as everything the prophet والسلام, delivered was 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 beneficial knowledge another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates the benefit or superiority of the one who gives over the one who takes, one who receives. That this is a trait which is uh, held in high, uh, high importance and is a, a, a trait of excellence that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
uh, illustrated from his sunnah. So we learn from this hadith that it is better, as the Prophet wasallam said, Yad al-Mu'ti al-Uliya, that the hand of the giver is the upper hand. Uh, another benefit of this hadith <clears throat> is this hadith also shows us that if there is a situation in which there is various uh, rights of, of persons that are that one must fulfill at the same time then there is a order or tartib uh, in which to fulfill those rights and it begins with uh, one's family and those closest to him another benefit of this hadith and other ahadith that we have covered <clears throat> is this hadith shows that the mother takes precedence over the father, that she has a fadl and a precedence uh, over the father. And if there was uh, a situation where someone had to uh, spend with regards to their their parents and one, uh, and, and, and they are both uh, deserving and, and in need, then, of course, beginning with the, the precedence begins with the mother, the mother over the father. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates, as we mentioned, that, they, that we begin spending with those closest to us and then the the next you know so our our ties of kin and those uh, and those relations which are uh from our uh our family <clears throat> those are some of the main benefits of this hadith of the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the next hadith narrated abu huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, A slave is entitled to his food and clothing, and he should not be burdened except with the work that he is capable of doing. Uh, reported by Muslim. This hadith uh, shows the better way of conduct is that one should offer one's male or female slave exactly the same kind and quality of food he himself partakes. Uh, while the same is not an obligation on him, however, it is an obligation on the master to provide them with the bare minimum necessities such as food and clothes. It further informs us that no assignment should be given to a male or female slave that far exceeds their capacity. If their master forces them to undertake such an assignment, there is no obligation on them to comply with such an instruction of their master. Uh, obviously, this could be very difficult to uh, for someone to practice if they were in a situation as such however it illustrates for us uh, being just that ju justice in Islam is of the utmost importance and that even in a situation where there are war captives that they have rights they have rights to not be abused and beaten and uh, uh, mistreated and that they should be clothed and sheltered and cared for and as was mentioned uh, they should be fed uh, similar to the one who owns them uh, eats and this is an obligation uh, in Islam another benefit of this hadith is it shows that uh, that it's permissible to use the servant or slave in that situation uh, for those activities 
which they are able to do so, as we mentioned. So it should not be be uh, anything which is beyond their ability. <clears throat> In the next hadith, <clears throat> narrated Hakim ibn Muawiyah al-Qushayri on his father's authority, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I asked, O Allah's Messenger, what is the right of the wife of one of us upon her husband? He replied that you should give her food when you eat and clothe her when you clothe yourself and do not strike her on the face and do not revile her. The narrator, the narrator narrated the rest of the hadith that has been mentioned in the chapter on the treatment of, of wives. Uh, the, in this hadith, <clears throat> some of the benefits of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is uh, first and foremost, it's another hadith which illustrates the haquq or haq uh, a zoja, that the rights of the, uh, the wife. And so what we gain from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is firstly that the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in were vigilant in uh, trying to understand uh, the religion and those obligations upon them and their families and with regards to their families. So the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in, they wanted to practice, they wanted ilm in order to practice, in order to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> in order to fulfill the rights uh, that were upon them. Radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that it is an obligation upon a husband to, of course, feed his, his wife, care for her, and to clothe her um, and to provide for her. And as many of the ulama mentioned, that also, of course, that includes the, the spiritual well-being. So it is upon the man, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al-kareem, ar-rijal al-qawimun al-nisa, the men are the maintainers uh, of the women, maintainers and protectors of the women, that it is on him to care for his household, to clothe them, to feed them, to uh, uh, provide uh, um, a suitable living place and these are the rights that uh, Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have laid out and the scholars they mention <clears throat> with regards to some of the masail pertinent to that if a man becomes for example a man who has wealth and then he becomes poor is it permissible uh, for the wife who is then unable to really be cared for meaning not just going beyond less than her her prior living standard but to a extent where he's poor and he can't provide for her can she uh, seek uh, khula in this uh, manner and some of the ulama they mention that yes that is her right to uh, to seek uh, to dissolve the the marriage and some they give the example of the Sahabiyat radiallahu ta'ala anhum wa radiallahu ta'ala anhunna ajma'in that they uh, were patient in those situations and they that we don't necessarily have evidence of them doing that practice of asking for divorce or asking to be separated during those situations and so that it's better to be patient under those circumstances. But of course, if a man was deliberately leaving off working and caring for his family, then that's a different uh, situation. In the next hadith, <clears throat> the 979th hadith, narrated Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the hadith of, uh, of the pilgrimage, which is a very long hadith, said in regard to the women, they have rights over you, uh, to provide them with their sustenance and clothing in a reasonable manner. Uh, Muslim reported it. In this hadith, this is another hadith which shows us and illustrates for us the importance of the 
uh, rights of the wives and the importance of nafaka of spending on the wives in ma'roof as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions and from this hadith this hadith shows us the that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave uh, great importance for his ummah to uh, pay attention and, and meet the needs and the rights of the wives and the women in general. And that this is from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and very important for uh, the men of the ummah to observe the rights of the women. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also uh, shows us that it is an obligation upon men to spend on their wives, to take care uh, of their wives. And we already talked about kifaya, about the, uh, that it should be that which is sufficient uh, with regards to ta'am, food, and drink, uh, and clothing, as well as uh, the, a place to live. That all of those, those are from the haq or hakuk, a, 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 a zojat uh, of the wives, that that is what is um, required of the men. So this hadith also affirms for us that very important right uh, of the women. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that that spending uh, should be, uh, this goes to the urf. And as we mentioned, uh, the fiqh principle of the al-ada muhakama that the the right, the uh, the customs of a people uh, actually has a place in the shara. That it is it is uh, what you base judgments upon if there is no uh, evidence in the Qur'an and the Sunnah which specifies that particular issue or ruling as we mentioned prior to this. So this hadith is one of those ahadith which illustrate for us that ma'roof, that spending in ma'roof, spending upon the women, that there is no, uh, you know, easy to uh, define limitation as far as financially a certain amount of gold a certain amount of dollars a certain amount of whatever accord but rather it goes to the custom to the custom of those people uh, with regards to what is uh, considered acceptable uh, acceptable means of spending and for example if for one uh, someone were living for example the uh, I'll give you the example of my locality in uh, in Seattle, Washington, in America, which is a very expensive uh, state, and the rents are outrageous. But say if someone lived there in a small household, a, a, a Muslim man, and he's taking care of his household, then it would be expected that he is able to hopefully at least rent an apartment so she has enough room, even if it's a one-bedroom, if they have no children, or whatever the case may be according to their means, but it would go to the custom. So in, in the, that locality, you probably will not find in, even in an un, halfway unsafe neighborhood, uh, a neighborhood that has more crime than other places, you will not find anything under X amount of dollars per month, probably a one bedroom, I would imagine anywhere from uh, 900 to a thousand dollars a month. So then that shows that that would be the expenditure according to the custom of those people. But however, if someone lived in another part of the country or even another part of Washington and, you know, some small town, for example, where you could find in a, a, a rental apartment for perhaps $400 a month, then that would be their customs even differ and they're even in the same state, the same country, the same everything but however because of the locality the orf 
the what is known uh, as expenditure differs and so this is how uh, when we go back to the custom of the people that we refer back to what it requires in that locality or in that uh, society uh, in the next hadith <clears throat> Narrated uh, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala in Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, said it is enough for a person to be considered sinful that he neglects those whom he is uh, responsible to sustain. Uh, reported by an Nisai, Muslim has this wording to withhold food from the one whose food he possesses. Uh, this hadith is a very important hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which illustrates for us that it is a major sin uh, to withhold the sustenance for those you're, you're to, to violate the rights of others, and especially those who you are charged in authority over in spending upon. And in this regard, One of the prime uh, benefits of this hadith is uh, this hadith mentions that uh, regarding the sin that uh, whenever you have a, <clears throat> this is one of the wabit or one of the criteria and some of the ulama mention with regards to whether determining whether something is a main, major sin or a minor sin. And one of those dhuabit or criterion is that uh, every sin in which a person is threatened with a punishment or threatened with the threat of punishment illustrates that that's a major sin, that it's not a minor sin. And so in this situation, in this hadith, it illustrates because there is a threat of uh, you know, mentioning specifically that the person has committed a sin, it illustrates that this is one of the major sins, that leaving off the rights of those you are responsible for caring for and spending upon is, in fact, a major, uh, a major sin. Another benefit of this hadith is that even the person who loses uh, and, and, and wastes that their earnings, for example, that they will be sinful as well, uh, and they will be sinful as well because they have wasted or lost that which is the right of someone else and that means spending on those who they are charged in authority over uh, for spending so it shows us to be very careful with our wealth that our wealth should be spent in halal and it should be protected and preserved and put in its rightful place meaning giving everyone their due rights who has a right over us with regards to our wealth and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of our many shortcomings I mean ya alameen uh, another benefit of this hadith is also it shows that a person should be very vigilant, that it's an obligation for a person to be vigilant uh, with uh, and aware of the rights of those who have rights over them. So it's not just uh, so, it, so because it's such a serious matter, so it's very important to know those who you are responsible to spend upon and not to uh, uh, be wasteful of their rights or neglect their rights. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also uh, illustrates for us the way in which the Sharia uh, emphasizes giving everyone their due rights uh, and that uh, that this is from the divine wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and to protect the believers from vum, from oppression, because we know that on the day of judgment, that those who oppress will be uh, recom recompensated or be compensated for the evil that they did with uh, darkness and with uh, and with punishment, and that also by being an, an oppressive sinner that someone they will have in, in, in usurping the rights of others that their right their uh, that on the day of judgment that those who they were responsible for that they will be able to get gain and get their uh, rights back from what a person uh, took from them and how they oppressed them and if that person has no good deeds left, then they will actually begin to be recomp recompensated or being be compensated from the good deeds of the uh, the oppressor. So it's very important to not oppress. Know who uh, know the rights of others and to give them their rights to the best of one's ability. And those are the main benefits of that hadith, and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.